Hey there, readers, writers, and friends. Story Serpent here. And today we are talking about Kate DiCamillo's new book, Ferris. It's a contemporary middle grade with a touch of magical realism. And it was published in March of 2024 by Candlewick Press. Before we get into that, today's random words are like, share, subscribe, Sashura. So before we talk about the book itself, when I saw that Kate DiCamillo had a new one coming out, I was very, very excited. This woman has written more modern classics than anybody else. And so I hoofed it along to the library to find as many of her previous works that I hadn't read as possible. And I scooped a bunch of them up and I brought them home and I was cruising through a couple of them. And then I realized about a third of the way into the Beatrice prophecy, I'd already read this one and promptly forgotten it. Do you know why? It's full of girl bosses, murdered men and boys who get totally forgotten, weak men who abdicate their responsibilities, who don't demonstrate real strength. The one young man who is effective with a sword she says it's a tragedy how quickly he takes to being an effective protector with a weapon. And when they all come across a man who has been pillaging and murdering people in the forest, bandit with a knife, big scary man, they disarm him and then carry on their way. A man who has murdered others gets to walk free. He is never brought to justice. It annoyed me like you would not believe. Like, oh, we've got to make Beatrice's mom queen because of course she thought her daughter should read. And I honestly think that whatever land this was supposedly taking place in, this is just a terrible place that makes no sense, that doesn't have appropriate consequences for people. And maybe if the men there were both strong and smart, it wouldn't have been a problem. I disliked this book so much I forgot I'd read it and picked it back up. This functions as a reminder that not everything from every author is going to be great and it's especially possible for as writers go on and either become more ideological or lose the heart of what made them great writers to begin with, things can go south really really fast and you can't trust every author. So that brings us to our new one, Ferris. Now, if we look at the cover, let me ask you, do you see any men? No, no, of course you don't. Despite the fact that what the book says for itself is, it was the summer before Emma Phineas Wilkie, who everyone called Ferris, went into the fifth grade. It was the summer that the ghost appeared to Charisse the summer that Ferris's sister, Pinky Wilkie, devoted herself to becoming an outlaw and the summer that Uncle Ted, not on the cover, left Aunt Shirley and moved into the Wilkie basement to paint a history of the world. When a ghost shows up at the threshold to Ferris's grandmother, Charisse's room, Ferris worries that she's there to take Charisse to the great beyond. But Charisse says that the ghost has something else in mind, something unpredictable, a task that's impractical and illuminating. But how can Ferris focus on completing an assignment for a ghost when her little sister is terrorizing the town, her uncle keeps sending her to spy on her aunt, and the house has been invaded by raccoons? As Charisse likes to say, every good story is a love story, and two-time Newbery medalist Kate DiCamillo has written a moving and hilarious story about family, community, and yes, always love. Okay. We have been told that spying for her uncle is going to feature prominently. Pinky terrorizing the town is going to feature prominently and the raccoon is going to be a big deal. We also are starting this off with the ghost has appeared to grandmother. The ghost is going, she has something that needs to be done. That's gonna be our, our big quest is, is figuring out what the ghost needs and wants done. And honestly, overall, this whole book reads like somebody put every Kate DiCamillo book into an AI large language model generator, gave it a few names, circumstances, and quirky things, and it spit out 
a book. Because despite the fact that the end line there is that every great story is a love story, there is no heart in this story whatsoever. It is bland. The quirks don't work together to form something charming. The language is just repetitive. It's not even interesting. It doesn't build on itself in interesting ways. The refrains don't come back around to say something new and interesting. And get this, that phrase, every story is a love story, appears in this book at least 13 times. I lost count. And then it disappears for the last quarter of the book. It doesn't come back around as part of the finale. I'm very disappointed. Very disappointed. But let's get into the nitty gritty. So what do we know from the book? Well, we know that there are no men on the cover. We have Ferris here. We have Charisse, who is her grandmother, who doesn't get called grandma or mima or granny or grandmother. She gets called by her name. And I've been seeing this pop up in more and more children's fiction. I do not approve. Children should respect their elders, their family members, the people who are taking care of them and who took care of them. They should be respected with affectionate titles, not on a first name basis. They call their friends by their first names. They should not be calling teachers, parents, and grandparents by anything other than an appropriate moniker. Pretty sure this is mom based on the descriptions of mom. This is probably Aunt Shirley who gets to be on the cover instead of Uncle Tim. Pinky, who doesn't really look five except for the missing teeth in this picture. She looks a little older and of course the dog gets to be here despite the fact that dad is engaged throughout the story and her best friend is a boy who doesn't make it onto the cover either and he features prominently in the story so we know that this is going to be as close to a calm gentle girl bossing as Kate DiCamillo can possibly give us. We have these purple end papers that are pretty nice, just simple title pages. And of course, the Ferris wheel under which Ferris was born, because that's the catchy, quirky thing about Ferris is she was born under a Ferris wheel, which just screams bad choices by stupid adults to me. If you are pregnant enough to possibly go into labor, why are you getting on a Ferris wheel? If you are the husband of a woman who is near to getting pregnant, why are you putting her on a Ferris wheel? Why are these people stupid and putting children in danger? And we're just supposed to think it's quirky. It's life. No, grownups should not be behaving this way. And then of course, since it is a library copy all taped up, I cannot get anywhere into to see the cover. I'm sorry, but the binding does look pretty good. As far as things that are going well, because praise where it's due always, the writing is very, very clear and it does integrate a lot of great vocabulary words because they were Ferris's vocabulary words from the previous year. And she had a very strict teacher who made her learn them named Mrs. Milk, I think is how you're supposed to pronounce her name. But a Mrs. Milk vocabulary word is another phrase. That whole phrase appears in the book again and again and again to accompany these vocabulary words and justify just defining them. No learning from context, no trying to sort out these things, no making the kids go look them up. It's just defined. It feels shoehorned. It doesn't feel charming or authentic or organic. It's just, we need better vocab words in this story. We need interesting words. Aren't words yummy? And for most bookwormish types, yeah, words are yummy, but especially when they appear in ways that feel authentic, in ways that genuinely surprise us, as opposed to just being, well, that's another vocab word I learned. It just feels silly. 
So let's talk about the characters. Ferris is very bland. We know that she's a bit of a rule follower and she is basically being told what to do and where to go. She doesn't push back against most of it. We know that she's caring. She's fairly likable, but she just feels like a place of observation for the other things that are going on. And you would expect with the description that, oh, the ghost is going to be really important. Ferris never sees the ghost. Oh, she's being told to go spy on her aunt by her uncle. She literally goes to see her aunt twice. Her aunt is a hairdresser. The first time she perms the girl's hair, which who perms like an 11 year old's hair and doesn't explain how to take care of it. So it just becomes a poofy disaster. Like that's another bad adult decision right there. And then when she goes to see her the second time, she's horrified by how poofy her hair has become, which is your fault, Aunt Shirley. And so she cuts it all off, which is why we end up with this terrible chop job on the front that makes Ferris look less like a girl and more like insert androgynous human number four. Moreover, Ferris often sounds more like an adult than the adults around her do. Her She's much calmer. She's much more put together than the grown-ups around her, and she often has better insights into what's going on than the grown-ups do. Her mom is rigid and aloof. She is a math teacher, but being the daughter of a math teacher, I can tell you that doesn't of itself make them that way. So the fact that mom ends up not being super likable and ends up being the one shouldering most of the responsibility for the household really frustrating like mom shouldn't have to be that way the fact that mom is that way is a little unnerving and i don't end up liking her very much as a character because she seems to be doing most of what she's doing just out of desperation younger sister pinky is an absolute maniac and if i had a five-year-old who behaved the way she did there would be serious consequences not just well you're grounded now she's Five, and grounding her did absolutely nothing. She ran off again. The girl gets arrested. Arrested because she tries to rob a bank. And when they go to pick her up, she is upset that she doesn't get her own mugshot and a wanted poster. This girl is delusional, and none of the adults in her life are trying to guide her energies into something healthier or more productive. Mom eventually decides we're getting you your own library card so that you can read about, you know, things other than being a criminal. But here's a question. Where did five-year-old Pinky get the idea that being a criminal was a glamorous endeavor in the first place? What is she reading that makes her think this? What is she watching that makes her think this? None of the adults, not even Ferris, her sister, inquire even once about what the source of this might be. They just try to distract her towards other things, which is how she ends up getting in trouble at the very end. And I'm sorry, but dad, dad is weak garbage. Listen to this bit. I'm going to be an outlaw, shouted Pinky, and that's great. There's nothing great about being a criminal, said Ferris. Everyone just calm down, said Ferris's father. He was always suggesting that people calm down. He was a very mild-mannered man. That was how he described himself. I am nothing but a mild-mannered man who loves the world and all its creatures, he said often. Ugh, gross. You do not get to unironically describe yourself as a mild-mannered man unless you are wearing blue spandex and a hope symbol underneath a white button-up t-shirt, buddy. You only get to be a mild-mannered man if you have also proven that you are a strong man who can command respect. And when you tell people to calm down, it's not just because you're afraid of them getting excessive, because you know you can't control the situation, because you're a weak piece of garbage. This man annoyed me from the minute he was introduced to the very end, where in a serious medical situation, he stands there and cries. He is absolutely useless from page one to the end of the book, which is page 226. 
Pinky gets arrested, remember? And you know what he does? He informs everyone that he has a meeting at the office. Bye. If your child just got arrested, if your child did something so dangerous, so insane that she is now in police custody, you get on the phone, you tell whoever you have a meeting with, I'm sorry, I have family issues to deal with, and you go deal with them like a man. This guy is limp from the top of his head to the tips of his toes, and I don't want my kids anywhere near an example like that. He's not helpful. He doesn't do anything other than kind of passively exist in the background until we get mom telling the story of that one time at the fair where he was so excited about going on the fair. So I don't know, maybe putting your pregnant wife on a Ferris wheel scared the life out of him and now he's just a ghost of himself, which speaking of the ghost, remember the ghost that's supposed to be so important that is supposed to have a task that is going to be you know, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be challenging and illuminating. Oh, yes. No, it's really not. It's not that challenging at all. The only thing it requires is for some candles to be purchased and a conversation to be had with Ferris's mom. That's it. That is what it takes to complete our Herculean task. It's not compelling. It's not that interesting. Ferris never sees the ghost, and the ghost only ever really interacts with Charisse, her grandmother. And even then, the resolution of that storyline is so patchy, it's so broken up by all these other things, all these other named characters. We haven't even talked about her best friend, her best friend's dad. We haven't talked that much about Mrs. Milk, who feels... Mrs. Milk, who features very prominently throughout the story, there are so many of these named characters and they're all doing disparate things. And one of the beautiful things about something like Because of When Dixie is that Kate weaves all these people's lives together in a way that is meaningful, in a way that is impactful, in a way that feels like it's got substance. This does not feel this way. It feels scattered. It feels unorganized. I don't like at least half of these characters. And if you don't like the characters, it's really difficult to feel properly engaged with them and to hang through the story to the end, which all of these disparate storylines, all of these scattered bits of things that are supposed to eventually come together don't really hang together in a meaningful way. I put this book down dozens of times when really I probably could have read it in a single sitting. I mean, it's a middle grade. It's got great big font, 200 pages of it, but it shouldn't have taken me that long. I just couldn't sit with it. And if I can't sit with it, your middle grade reader is probably going to have a really difficult time getting there. The point of the story seems to be all of these disparate things that happened over the course of these summer weeks taught Ferris some things about herself that when, spoiler alert, her grandmother does pass away come winter, because winter and old people, she's more prepared for it than she thought she might have been or that she was at the beginning of the summer when she's very afraid about the idea of grandmother dying. If you get there, that's kind of interesting. And I did have that moment of illumination towards the end where I was like, oh, that's what this is all about. This, you know, this really could be titled The Summer Ferris Learned to Cope with the Idea of Death. And having that sense of that's what this is about might have helped me move through the book better, but probably not. The events aren't compelling, they're not interesting, the characters are bland, or they're just awful. And like I said, it, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if someone told me this was Kate's first foray into AI. Overall, The Story Serpent gives this a mostly meh. Good luck getting your kids to read all the way through it, quite honestly. 
Um, if you're a teacher and you want a justification for getting all of your vocabulary words for a few weeks from a pre-done source where all the definitions are right there, good on you. Go to town. This is never going to be your kid's favorite book. And reading through it was not my favorite experience. Anyway, that's all I have for today. If you've got a story you want to see the serpent take on, feel free to put it in the comments below. Until we meet again, read on, write on, and stay sharp.